It's the Just Basketball Show for August 1st. We're in August. Unbelievable that the summer is flying by. We're going to be at the NBA season in basically like two months. Training camp starts. Wild times that's going through. But guys, before we'll get more serious basketball questions as we get closer. But a cold open for you today. Um, an Italian gymnast, I'm forgetting her name, went viral, um, at least in my little corner of the internet, on Wednesday for being sponsored by uh, a Parmesan cheese company and was had all these photos of her with like big blocks of cheese. And like, that was the whole marketing campaign. So let me ask you this. If you, if you were going to, you could pick what food or drink item I'll extend it to drink you were going to be sponsored by. So you like a had to do this photo shoot, but theoretically it's like you go somewhere or like you never have to worry about like buying something again. What item are you picking? Uh, this one is really easy to me. Give me a bourbon. I want to be mm. sponsored by a bourbon. Uh, not only would I love to be photographed with bourbon, I love to also drink bourbon. It's another great use for bourbon. And um, <laughs> if I were to get free bourbon for the rest of my life, I would be saving a lot of money. So um, Practical. I actually, little quick story on this. My wife and I, when we were engaged, we did our engagement photo shoot at a bar. Mm. Uh, it was a nice bar. It wasn't like not nice a not nice bar but it was sort of like one of those like kind of higher end bars but we were already i already have several photographs with and around bourbon so uh and we did it actually with a glass of johnny walker black label in our in each of our hands so we were kind of just sipping on the black label as we we're kind of going through this photo shoot at it doesn't matter what time it was actually that's not relevant and you guys don't have to know that but uh yeah i would pick bourbon it's five o'clock somewhere Wes, is what i would right. say yes it was uh, several hours before 5 p.m. Eastern time, but that's okay. okay. It's okay. Brendan, do you have an answer for this? My mind just goes to when. If you say those like cold ass. <laughs> I was, gonna, right now, I I was gonna. I was gonna say, is it chips? I was gonna make the joke, no. and I. Well, I'm glad you did it too, Wes. It's not that far off from what I was gonna say, but no, I'm not. I wasn't taking us back there. No, I. I was just thinking of nil. My head just kind of went there, and then I was like, those bowl games that are sponsored by cheese it and pop tart i was kind of into oh, yeah. it yeah i like the idea of just yeah. getting some free snacks and it's like mm -hmm. one of those things where i don't actively like want that all the time but if i had a deal where that was just available to me and sent to me for free i wouldn't hate it so either one of those some college football nil offerings of of delicious snacks that's my pick the, if you if 50 percent of your pop tart shipment or a specific kind of pop tart so 50 percent is all the other pop tarts and then 50 percent is one pop tart mm -hmm. which pop tart are you picking for the majority of our pop tart uh your weekly shipment i suppose however sponsorship works. Week, weekly shipment of pop tart sounds unhinged when i was a kid i was really into the disgustingly sweet double chocolate ones i don't yeah. think i could do that now i'm not sure i could really make that happen so probably cherry i like the cherry ones Hmm. Ooh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cherries, nice little cinnamon. Side cinnamon ones are good. The whatever cinnamon sugar, that whatever my, that one's yeah, called. That'll be, that'll be my that be my answer. Yeah, yeah. cinnamon uh, sugar ones. Mine growing up and still is the without frosting strawberry, unfrosted strawberry. Wes, when's last time you guys off. had a had a? That's yeah, gross. Wes, like no. <laughs> come on. That's that's. Yeah, just just be a just like if awkward. you're gonna eat a pop tart, just eat the one just with the more the sugar. I I, I really. It has. I just prefer it like slightly less sweet, a little bit more of that crust flavor. I also never understood kids who cut the crust off of the sandwiches. It's my favorite part. Is the crusty? Yeah, we can part. we can agree on that. But that's equating that to like a non frosted pop tart is is, un, is unbelievable. To answer beautiful. your question, the last time I think I had a pop tart, I had to be college. I used to eat two at a time, like yeah, you know, like John Travolta with the pizza, like two yeah. at a time. See, movie reference. Yeah, look at this guy. Nice. He knows who John Travolta is. That. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I used to do it. But yeah, I've had a pop tart recently. Pop -tart recently? I think yeah. I okay. mean, within the pat within twenty twenty four, I believe I I've had one somewhere. Humble brag. I had one of the protein ones today, not from the pop tart brand, but like one of like oh, the the protein toaster it. pastries today. They're pretty good. They're not nice. quite the same, and they don't toast the same, which is kind of a problem. If I'm being honest, it's like a, a, a nitpick in the R and D of of that product, but they're still pretty good. Um, my answer is Miller. That many times soon. No, well, I, I would gladly hawk for them. They're they're the macro is unbelievable. Um, my answer is more line of the West is give me just a Miller Lite sponsorship or a Modelo, like whichever one. 
I just want to be able to go to a bar and not have to like pay for beer or a it baseball was, game and pay it, not pay it, for Miller it, Lite. It's a great answer. Uh, another network uh, that you that all of us had once done podcasts for. We had a Miller Lite sponsor. I want to say at Did one we? point. Yeah. We had a I, Michelob. I remember the Michelob, Michelob one. We had Michelob. Oh, maybe it was Michelob Ultra. It Never mind. Michelob. Okay. Scratch I, that. Look, I would like any like. I'll take like, that. It might have been like, the greatest what? like two months of my life. Is when yeah. we were able <laughs> to do the beer eats. <laughs> until until you until this podcast gets like a maker's mark at Reed West. Ninety proof is a little heavy for me. I actually have to lay low on the maker's mark. But give oh. me like just a good Jim Beam or an old granddad, just an eighty proof bourbon. Doesn't have to be fancy. I'm not asking for much. Just something I could put on ice. And sip. Speak it. Speak right. it into like existence. A... Let's go, boys. All right. On today's show, we've got sipping. Speaking Sorry. of sipping, Wes, to... Wes is just gonna like to lead you into the. Wes is at one point just gonna walk away and come back, and he's just gonna be like pouring a little. He's like thinking about the bourbon now. It is where we're recording. You can't see what's in this cup. That's that's true. We have no idea what is in your in your I believe Yeti cup over there. But all right, on today's show, we've got Olympic basketball. Bam out of bio, absolutely killing it for Team USA. We'll talk about him. And then we've got a round of what matters most between Jared Allen's extension, Luke Kennard going back to Memphis, and Precious Achua going back to the Knicks. That is all coming up today on the Just Basketball Show. Hey there, welcome into the Just Basketball Show. I'm Chris Manning. We have Brendan Cleaner. We have Wes Goldberg here. Thanks again for tuning in to your right now two times a week, but during the season and most weeks of the year, three times a week show for all things basketball. It's NBA, WNBA, trades, Olympics, everything and more. I want to tell you too that support for today's episode of the Just Basketball Show comes from BetMGM. If you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, use bonus code just basketball and you'll get up to a $1,500 first bet offer and first wager with BetMGM. Here is how it works. Step one, download the BetMGM Sportsbook app on iOS or Android and sign up using code just basketball. Step two, deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game. Step three, you receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if the bet loses. Just make sure to use bonus code just basketball when you sign up. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Must be 21 or older to wager. Terms and conditions apply. Do want to remind you to find us on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, anywhere you can find podcasts as well. Find us, subscribe, rate, review, please, and thank you. Guys, let's start with the Olympics because I'm just going to get a take off the bat before we get into the game itself. Bam Adebayo at some point is just going to win a Defense Player of the Year award, and if he like if that if we just get to a point where that doesn't happen, I'm frankly going to be surprised. This guy is one of the Best three to five defenders, I think, in basketball. I think just flat out one of the smartest players we have in basketball right now. And I think you could have looked at this roster and can work yourself into a take. It's like, okay, they have AD. They can go small with other guys at the five and get weird. They have Embiid. Do they do they really need Bam on this roster? And this game, because he gets extended minutes with Embiid sitting, he had 18, an 8 of 10 shooting, 7 rebounds, a really great defensive performance. This is just flat out one of the best players in the world, and I. this is one of the most fun games I've ever watched Bam play. Well, first of all, thank you and welcome to Bam Adebayo Island. Uh, there's is it the Bam Wagon? I believe it's the Bam Wagon. I, I, Dean Waiters was the island. Isn't this the Bam Wagon? This is the Bam Wagon. We have rows upon rows available. And um, But to, about the Defensive Player of the Year part, which I don't think is your main take here, but I've got six words for you as to why Bam will never win Defensive Player of the Year. Victor Webanyama, okay, that it's just not going to happen. He's gonna he's gonna win it next year, and he's gonna win it for the next ten okay. years probably. Bam ought to have already won Defensive Player of the Year, but I have two words for you as to why that didn't happen. Boston Media Mafia, <laughs> John Corral. Okay, okay. he yeah. should have won so, the Marcus <laughs> Smart year. Is that is that your take? That's absolutely right. Mm. Um, just because a guy is short doesn't mean he should win awards. Sorry, doesn't work that way. Uh, we live in the United States. Um, wow. So, just... it, uh, that said, I love this band performance as the resident Miami guy. Not only did he have 18 points, he led Team USA with 18 points. Not only did he have 18 points, he scored six of them off corner three-pointers, which were wonderful to watch. Again, as somebody who watches a lot of Bam out of bio, he has made... More corner threes during this summer, if you include the exhibitions and Team USA, than he had made than he had attempted all of last season for the Heat. 
he he attempted just seven three corner three pointers all of last season. They have somehow Timo Se has unlocked Bam Adebayo in a way that he's never been unlocked before, which is strange considering that his head coach is on the staff. But uh, I I love this game, and to me, and this sounds really strange because Bam Adebayo, as we know, is a three time All Star. This to me was his coming out party. This to me was if to a national audience that didn't really know what Bam could do. This was it. You mentioned all the defensive possessions on the perimeter, switching across multiple positions in one possession. I think I think Olympic basketball is generally for I, I think people who tweet about it and talk about it are like the big fans of the game, right? Like I, I think that's fair to say that understand and appreciate some of the nuances of basketball. Eleven million people and watched I, it apparently, which shocked me. Not this game, but the last game, which is pretty crazy. Too, yeah. Yeah. Um so I, I think all those things were on display, and another big part of this is that Bam, when he has had the national stage, hasn't always shined, right? He's a three-time All-Star. He has scored, I think, a total of four points in All-Star games, like across all of them. The guy doesn't – he barely is a participant in the All-Star games because it's not what he does, right? Bam doesn't thrive as a scorer despite leading Team USA with scoring tonight, but he thrives with screen setting, playing defense, things that you don't do in an All-Star game, right? So he doesn't have any business being there. Uh, I think even in the 2023 finals, which was his biggest stage he's ever had, right? And he was hurt in the in the 2020 bubble. In the 2023 finals, he averaged 22, 6, and 3 in that series and played pretty good defense, as good as you're going to do against Nikola Jokic. It didn't matter because the Heat lost in five games and it wasn't very competitive. So he could have averaged 32 points a game. Nobody would have cared because the Heat got blown out in that series. So this, to me, is sort of his first real big performance on a big national stage of this kind. And I think people are starting to understand what it is that people who appreciate Bam Adebayo appreciate Bam Adebayo for. Yeah, Chris, you said that, well, I'll just say it. They do not need him. That's kind of the funny thing about all of this, right? Like... They don't need him to be this good. They don't need him on the roster. There were questions about if he should or could or would play because this whole team is just an embarrassment of riches. You bench the 2023 NBA MVP, the guy that they mounted a international geopolitical campaign to recruit in Joel Embiid, and it doesn't matter because the guy we all thought would be getting DNPs or could be is just out here getting buckets all of a sudden. So I think that just... Yeah, you don't need any one single player on this team. And I think that's sort of your point, is you could bench LeBron James and still probably win this whole thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And him scoring is very cool. I will just say, I know we're, we're trying to be respectful of this, and it you know it's one of those things I think the, the NBA media, WNBA media, has agreed not to talk about. But him and the starting center on the women's team are both getting threes up. I feel like they may or may not have been working together on getting those shots up and, and you know maybe per- perfecting their form or whatever. Asia Wilson also flashing a three ball. They may or may not have some kind of something going on there. So just shout out to both of them for rounding out their games. Is that what they were talking about at that lunch? Yeah, three pointers. Yeah, that they've just been. Yeah, yeah they've been in the in mm-hmm. the lab. Exactly. Yeah, you just cooking in the lab. Yeah, no. cooking. This team USA team, I think, also just you. I you know we got the quotes from Curry before this game about like, oh, you have to show up every day, everyone seriously. We had that as well in this. And normally, I like kind of you know I I maybe I'm jaded, maybe I'm just cynical about this at this point, having heard these versions of these quotes for my whole life and 10 years covering the NBA and whatnot, but they actually like did take this game much more seriously than they did in the exhibition round against South Sudan when they, when they one by one and barely escaped this game felt intense from team USA. It felt purposeful. Um, Everything about this team just feels very just in sync right now. It's like the way they're playing and the way they can pull the levers if they need to with bam or, you know, the rants coming off the bench or whatever it is. It feels like they are just going to be able to pull any lever and outpace these teams and go on these like 23 to four runs. And it's just not, might not be competitive this alternative if they play like this. Like that, that is my, my big takeaway from the first two games, guys, is if they just play with this intensity and they're getting this from everybody, there might not be like a particularly competitive game for them in this tournament. Yeah. I think against Serbia in that first game, right? They got out of the gate and were behind early on and they just sort of turned it on, took Joel and beat out, but also turned it on and went ahead and blew out Serbia. And in this game, they are blowing out South Sudan the entire first half. South Sudan makes a little bit of a run to start the second half. They call a timeout. 
kind of a fake worried timeout, like, all right, let's kind of really get this thing together, but we're not super concerned, but still came out of that timeout, went on another run. So every time they've been even sort of quote unquote tested, they have kind of grouped together and made some sort of effort to make another run and, and, and blow the gate open on, on both of these games. So uh, this has been dominant of a performance so far. Um, I guess the next question is, what do we do about this? Like, what are we making of no Tatum and no Halliburton in the first game? No Embiid in this game. And it looked like Drew Holiday might have also had been, uh, or, or Tyus Halliburton would have been another scratch. Drew Holiday sent to the bench for this game. I think that they went to them late just because they could and it didn't matter. But, Brendan, do you think that this should be maybe the the strategy going forward is let's just bench two guys a game because we have such an, 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 uh, an embarrassment of riches that yeah. there's no real... It's either I'm going to deal with these questions if I'm Steve Kerr every single game because I physically cannot play all these players in a 40-minute game, or it, the other version of that is, you know what? Everybody's getting an, Everybody gets one game off, and we just sort of round robin, take turns, who gets the rest? In the group stage, I think you absolutely can play it that way. There's no real need to, to overdo it. They've already banked two wins against other teams that you would expect to get wins, so they're, they're at a an advantage already just by taking care of business. The first couple, they play Puerto Rico on Friday. That's a game you would think they could win. That's an undersized team. I understand that they have guards who could go off, but he already, Steve Kerr already said that um, Holiday and Embiid will return to the starting lineup in that one, um, I believe. So maybe it's, I don't know, Durant gets a game off because he's still coming back and Derek White, you're you're gonna you're gonna rest in this one, and I don't think that would change my opinion of if they can win. I've said it every time we've talked. I do think they'll be pushed. I do think they'll be tested. We talked about some of the teams that could do that to them: France, Greece, Canada, you know, whatever, Spain, even potentially. It just might not have to be in this group stage, so they should be playing it. I mean, they have three guys in their mid thirties, multiple players with injury histories. Why not? Yeah, I mean, LeBron probably should, like, arguably take off the next game. Durant should maybe get to take off the next game. It's like, give these guys, Durant, who was injured coming into this, and, you know, it's been awesome when he's played, but maybe give him a game off. You could probably give LeBron a game off against Puerto Rico, and it would be Anthony okay. Anthony Davis tweaked his ankle a little bit yep. in the first half of this yeah. one. Just be super careful with it. Yeah, be super careful. You have the talent. It's not like you're going to be need to throw in JaVale McGee or Keldon Johnson or anyone like that at the back end of this. Now, like, some of the guys, they might not want to. I would understand that, but... Big picture, I think it's absolutely the right move to do it that way, and they benefited from this group. I mean, if they if they had, their group had ended up being more stacked, I think it would have been harder to do that. But you've cruised through two games. Puerto Rico is not particularly good. They might be competitive and feisty and play really hard, but like you should beat them pretty cleanly, even if you rest you guys again. It really should not be a problem for them going forward. Yeah, I just wonder if Steve Kerr would just be better off saying it, just so that he doesn't have to deal with questions about why did the Jason Tatum or player X get a DNPCD. Maybe every maybe all the reporters just said, you know what, we were also sick of that storyline after we asked you about it. We sort of get it. I we're feel good. like this game kind of put it to, to bed, yeah. though, don't you? Because in this one, he not only played Tatum, but started him after that was such a storyline. And then Embiid, who's been struggling, and should they demote him, or was the recruitment a mistake, and all these questions that were getting thrown around about him. Well, he went to the bench and... It was kind of a non-story. It didn't affect the game. So I feel like he basically illustrated, Kerr, this is how it's going to work. We're going to play the same way and win the same way regardless. And it'll just be matchup-based. Today, he said, with South Sudan, they knew they were going to need to switch. They knew they wanted to have their athletes on the court. They're faster, more you know, finesse players. More often than not, they did that. AD's out there. Tatum's out there. More minutes for... You know, uh, bam, Halliburton gets out there, everything else. So th I think this is just going to be the pattern, and he just showed it to us, and I don't think it'll be a story anymore. Probably isn't. Uh, do, you guys, do you guys have any other roster thoughts, any other thoughts about this Olympic tournament, about Team USA, where they're at right now? Anything percolating for you as far as Team USA goes? Not Team USA. I'm, I'm interested in the other games that are going on still, you know, like Serbia got a win. Jokic did what we expected him to do. Basically got a triple double. How do these other guys play and 
who does end up being that biggest test. That's kind of what I have my eye on because this this team's passing all the tests we expected them to. Yeah, I can't say that I've watched any of the games and thought I'm really worried about that team against Team USA, but I agree with what you're saying. I do think that they're going to get tested at some point. I just – obviously, it hasn't happened yet. It's not going to happen against Puerto Rico, but – it will happen at some point. I just think that the United States right now, Team USA, is so much, and this is really strange to say, further ahead than some of these other teams are, which is mm -hmm. weird considering that Team USA is a team that's never played together, and a lot of these other teams have played together, right? They, these other teams don't look bad, and maybe it's just virtue of Team USA is just so talented that chemistry literally doesn't matter, but they do seem to be in lockstep right like they yeah i it but does I, feel I, like they know how they're playing together. so i but i think some of that is because of the talent like i think a lot of the guys on this roster i'm not going to say all of them but i think a lot of the guys on this roster have that thing where they are really good at melding with other players pretty organically lebron has been great at that his whole career i think curry you know to some degree he is can be very distinct to play with but i think he's actually pretty good at bringing the best out of others bam is like that like, really, Embiid is, like, the one guy on the roster who I think is probably the most uncomfortable for this roster to play with. But I think almost everyone else on this roster, from LeBron on down, when there's one of their best things about them being a basketball player is the fact that they really organically mesh well with other guys and kind of can improvise and get in the flow. I mean, you guys saw all the Durant tweets when he was, like, arguing with people about, like, the basketball is in football and all this stuff. It's like all these guys have some of that in their DNA in a way that I think blend, lends to them kind of blending together pretty organically. Well, I would also just say we talked about this heading into the tournament, right? This is somewhat of a transitional era in a lot of other countries' yeah. programs. So I think that's actually why we don't feel scared of a lot of these other countries, despite the talent and the names that might be on the rosters, is they actually haven't played together a bunch. Victor Wembanyama, this is his first time in any primetime big national tournament with France. Spain, they don't have their Rubio and the Gasols group that they used to have. We... Uh, in Australia, it's more of the giddy show and can this young group get something figured out? Patty Mills is too old and France's guards aren't what they used to be. Greece, it's the first time Giannis has, has led them anywhere. Serbia, Jokic didn't play in the World Cup last year. Slovenia missed the cut, which was a team that we would have expect has always pushed the U.S. when they've had a chance, partially because of their chemistry and partially because Luka just is perfect for this environment. So I, I think that actually does kind of tell the story is Team USA certainly doesn't have chemistry or any sort of time advantage, experience advantage together, but nobody else really does either. So it is kind of just a talent free for all and they're going to win if that's the case, you know? Still, it feels yeah. like an ending up with like the if the test is like Canada, I just can't believe we're going to work back to like LeBron like dominating Dylan Brooks and like that's how we decide the Olympics. Like it's the playoffs from two years ago again. And, just and that's like another that's good example. I was going to say that one, right? Murray SGA. That's new. There is a little bit of a question yep. of not that it's gone poorly, but like nobody gonna, just th poured it over this it this dominant group yeah. that the U.S. has to fear from that standpoint, which usually yeah, is the Canada case. Played Australia played Canada close the other day. Um, you know, France is two and zero, but they had to go to overtime against Japan to get that one. Uh, Germany is second in the group stage and overall point differential at plus thirty three. That's still the team to me that I keep pointing at and saying like, when when Team USA meets Germany, that's going to be the problem because yeah. they have size, they can get hot from uh, from three point range, things like that. So, and and that's the chemistry uh, team we would say they about, do about have the tournament, right. yeah, yep. And they have the chemistry team. They're coming off the gold medal from last summer. So, yeah, I mean, all of the above, right? It's it's a transition year for a lot of these national programs. It's a bounce back year for Team USA, right? It's also an organization that is very motivated to have a big season too. So, it was, you know, I, I think all, these, all this stuff comes into play. The last thing is not so much about the – it's not about the Olympics, but did you guys see these Cooper flag quotes about how he – that he, A, went on his Duke teammates podcast, which is just where we're at in, in – Cooper flag talking and was learning about this, but um, he talked about having to how under how the nerves and just, he said, wow, I was guarding LeBron in the corner and it like it hit him for a second. And then he just snapped out of it. I cannot wait to just, I, I know we're like a year away from him getting drafted. I am just, I'm going to watch so much Duke this fall based on what he did with team USA and his reputation. I just, every time this guy talks, I am fascinated by this. And part of me kind of wishes he was on this roster just so he could like experience it. I know that's not, you can't like shotgun 
a 17 year old to that level necessarily in this stage of it. And maybe there would have been a younger NBA guy you wanted to put on there instead, but I am just perpetually going to be fascinated by Cooper flag. And I, I was reminded of that when him talking about these quotes and him getting Tim guarding LeBron and whatnot is that also in itself feels like a big transitional moment in where we're headed here. Isn't that center from South Sudan also on that Duke roster? He ended up picking Duke, right? Malik? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So coach that team coached by Royal Ivy, which is just like, I went down the Royal Ivy Wikipedia rabbit hole when I realized Shout out that to Royal Ivy, Luol Dang president of the whole thing. Like, all good stuff. Yeah, it's very, very cool. All right, um, let's move on. we got a game of what matters most. A couple bits of NBA news in the slow doldrums of August. Jared Allen, three-year extension that will keep him in Cleveland, theoretically, for the next five years. $131 million over those five seasons for Mr. Allen. Cavs running it back, it would seem. We've got Luke Kennard going back to the Grizzlies on an $11 million one-year deal. And presses to chew a one-year $6 million to the New York Knicks. Brennan, we'll start with you. Which one of those matters most? My answer is Luke Kennard, but I think we should actually start with you because the biggest Uh news is the one that you think is the biggest, I think, if we're all being honest. I have a case, and I will gladly make it for the Memphis Grizzlies, who I am all in on to the 100 percentile, but the Cavs are just not doing any of the things we thought this offseason was going to be about outside of hiring a coach. They retained the guy we all thought was gone. I am I am surprised that we've gotten here. Kobe Altman goes to his postseason media availability, and he basically says, we're going to run it back. Like, we're going to get a new coach. Thank you to JB for your service. They get Kenny Atkinson after that long process. They're effectively running it back. His word has ended up true. There are going to be there's something going on in the edges right now. If they, it, there's Michael Scotto from Hoops Hub has reported um, that they're trying to trade, do a sign and trade with Brooklyn for Dorian Finney Smith involving Isaac Okoro. So Okoro goes out in the sign and trade. They take back Dorian Finney Smith. Okoro, they've, they, they're offering him below the mid level right now between eight to ten million dollars. Okoro's looking for like twelve to fifteen. So there, there's something to be figured out there. But that's a marginal move. The The big move would have been a Jared Allen trade. It would have been a Darius Garland trade. We know from Jake Fisher, the Spurs called about Garland. They didn't rebuff. We don't know what the offer was, obviously, but they didn't do a Garland trade. I am pretty surprised that this is actually what this ended up because I just don't – I still don't think it makes sense. I think Jared Allen on this contract is good value. I think it's a good contract. I think Allen is worth it. That is one of the – of the non like pure all-star centers that's one of the first that would be probably the first non like apex center i would want on my roster he can do just what everything you beside from bam i think it's like and i would have bam in that upper tier he can rim protect he can play drop he can step up with the line he can switch he can dunk he can do a little bit of dho work like he can do kind of everything you would want to do aside from three-point shooting as a five in the modern nba yeah here's but a question also actually now since maybe they're Evan making Mobley, the- even more since they're making the same amount of money, him or Hartenstein, who do you guys like more? Who would you rather have? They're basically I, making thirty million each and have a decently similar skill set. Who do you like more if you were to just like get your pick to add either of them to a roster in a vacuum? I think I would go Jared Allen. I would go Jared Allen as well. Yeah, I like it yeah. too. I I, I think the, the on- finishing the downhill yeah. ability, kind of the the paint offense I think is, is nice. Even though the passing might be a little worse, maybe. Yeah. Hardenstein offers more playmaking. If you need that as like a fulcrum of your offense, Mm Allen doesn't totally offer that, but Allen I think has, is a better finisher and he's much more of a lob threat in in that traditional five cents. Hardenstein's a better rebounder. He's more physical. I think Jared Allen is just a guy who could be productive, which is just so rare at that position. It also sort of depends on the team. I know you probably didn't want to go down yeah. this rabbit hole, but yeah, it does. A team of course that didn't it need does. production from the center spot. Yeah. You know, yeah, like if I was like the Pacers, I would rather have Allen, but if I was the Thunder, I think Hartenstein makes more sense. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I am surprised that we ended up here with Cleveland. I It just felt like this was going to be a summer where if you, you especially if you got Mitchell to resign and they did, it felt like that demanded some kind of pivot. And whether that was Allen or Garland or both or whatever it was going to be, I think we knew they were going to give Mobley the rookie max extension. I think we knew they wanted to keep Mitchell. And it felt like they needed to do something else to evolve. And they're basically saying, Kenny Atkinson, you will evolve us. That, to me, is risky. That, to me, carries a lot of risk to bet all of that on Kenny Atkinson getting more out of Garland, more out of Mobley, and the same rough structure of your team still being in place. So they've got now Donovan Mitchell 
committed under contract through at least 2027. Garland is under contract through 2028. Jared Allen through 2029. Evan Mobley through 2030. This is the team, right? And I think we all thought that there was going to be some kind of pivot here. But this is why the Cavs were in such a tough spot in the first place. It's really hard to trade Jared Allen when he's the best two-man game partner with the player you just committed the franchise to and Donovan Mitchell, right? You're really going to sign Donovan Mitchell to a contract extension and say, you know what? The guy who you run pick and roll with the best, he's out of here. It, that's sort of the tough thing that they've got to do between Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. And I've talked about this for a long time. Everybody agrees that Evan Mobley would be better off playing center in Cleveland. Everybody agrees that Jared Allen and Evan Mobley don't exactly work together. But you're sort of in win-now mode. And you're just going to get rid of a good player because the, the, the developmental guy isn't necessarily developing the way you want him to. When you have your star guy already in Donovan Mitchell, it'd be one thing if you didn't have Donovan Mitchell, then it makes a little bit more sense to sort of build everything around Mobley, but you don't. The other part about this too is, if you were going to trade Jaron Allen, where are you going to trade him? That's yeah. the thing. Everybody says New Orleans. It's like, I don't want Brandon Ingram. I don't want to pay that next contract. No way. I'd rather just have Jared Allen. And the Oklahoma City Thunder figured their thing out when they signed Hartenstein. They were another team that was sort of a rumored destination for Jared Allen. So show me the team that really wants to trade for Jared Allen. Now, I think the Golden State Warriors would have made a lot of sense for them. They obviously did not agree with me. They have been chasing the Larry Markin entail this whole summer. Yeah. Uh, the other part about this, too, is Darius Garland. I think we all also agree probably best to split up that backcourt. Who's trading for Darius Garland? He's I mean, a really Spur good player. The Spurs Who's tried. For him? We know the Spurs tried to, but we don't, the, the offer was tried. Like, tried. Sort of. And like, were, but what, what does that even mean? And, and if it, you're Cleveland— yeah, they lowballed Cleveland. Yeah, it was like, and then right. the Spurs decided that they could just get Chris Paul, and they said, you know what, we'd rather just do this on a short-term thing, and then figure out our point guard situation later. Yeah, and then once the Spurs went off the board, and by the way, once the Brooklyn Nets also went off the board when they did that pick, their swap for their own picks back, coming back, and all this, basically opening the door for them to tank and purposely not be good. They had no interest in trading for Darius Garland, so there's not really a team out there that makes a whole lot of sense that should be trading for yeah. Darius Garland, or at least giving the Cavs something worthwhile to come off of a player who has been in an all-star game and is still a very good player in a vacuum, even if we agree the fit's not that good, and you say, well, I guess let's just figure out what the new coach can do with it because all these guys are under contract. They're all relatively yeah. young. We can make these trades later if we have to. I also would add that I think the, the, they're probably looking at this, and, I, and this is where I sympathize with this and agree with this to some degree, is that I think Kenny Atkinson is going to be the best coach for Darius Garland that Darius Garland has ever had. John Bayline was not that. J.B. Bickerstaff was not that. If Atkinson is anything, we have a track record of him. He has made his point guard better. Even in, in, I would think you could say in Brooklyn, not all the pieces fit together perfectly in the way you'd want to build a perfect team. And he got really good stuff out of D'Lo. He got really good stuff out of Dinwiddie. He got good stuff out of Carousel Levert there and all, making all of those guys work. I do Best think seasons he, for all of those guys. Right. And it's like if you said, okay, I'm still scared about it. I still would want to split them up, I think. But if you're the Cavs and you're saying there's not a great offer for us out there and we don't really want to go in the Brandon Ingram business, we don't there, We don't want to just get bad picks back just for the sake of moving Garland and have to go scramble to find something else when we trade this big salary, I do kind of understand saying like, okay, at least we have Kenny Atkinson and we get a, maybe we figure this out for six months or a year or something, and then we can pivot from there. But at least you can see what a, a coach with a more modern proven sensibility can do with this guy. Like I, it's not perfect, but I, if the market dictated that, I also understand how you get there, even if I don't love it. Yeah. Look with Allen, forget Ingram. They weren't going to trade for Ingram. It would have been a three team deal. They're getting something. Ingram's going somewhere else. Allen's going to new Orleans. The Pelicans have a crappy contract structure. That's part of why they're stuck. They have McCollum and Ingram making a ton of money who nobody really wants. And then a lot of their mid-tier guys are untouchable. Murphy, Herb Jones, whatever. Those guys aren't going anywhere because they want them. So let's set that aside. I, I, we don't know what the market was probably because that deal just was going to be too messy. And, and that's why they're in the position that they're in. I, I think we all can get how they came to that conclusion that that wasn't worth pursuing. And okay, fine. But they also didn't have to extend him. The money's fine. He'll be trade eligible for a week ahead of the deadline, right? January 31st, if he indeed signs that today. If it's tomorrow, then, you know, six days, whatever. So they could still trade him midseason if they want to. But I think with Allen, my thing is, we just had that little thought experiment with Hartenstein and, and went around on, like, 
okay, where do these types of players fit? What tier are they in? All that stuff. But the market has kind of shown us that these players are exactly the types of guys that actually do end up getting caught in no man's land and get stuck on their own teams, mm. right? I mean, I just covered a similar situation for two, three years of a saga like this with DeAndre Ayton. I think Allen has proven to be a better player, more valuable player, somebody more teams would want to have, but the Suns signed DeAndre Ayton to a max and he became very difficult to trade right away until Joe Cronin convinced himself that he could turn his career around and, and bit the bullet on that whole thing and the Suns got a breath of fresh air. But there's guys like this where not being a superstar where you can create offense for yourself and be a real difference maker on both sides consistently, or you're a role player and you're paid like it, that is a type of center that the league just doesn't value. So I think they're going to have a hard time trading him, period, unless the Pelicans can figure it out and get desperate enough to overpay and make it worth the Cavs' while. But bigger picture with all of this, to me, the bigger concern with it is at some point, and I've been on this since they got eliminated by the Knicks two years ago, is even if it means getting a little bit worse, the track that you just laid out, Chris, that this team could convince itself it could go down to improve with a coach and internal development, they're not allowing themselves to do that because Evan Mobley and Darius Garland are not going to reach their ceilings with the other players that are on this team. That's just a fact of reality. So the world where Kenny Atkinson plus more years of growth for the two young guys that were here before all of this ever got kicked off. That's just a fantasy land. In my opinion, that's not, that's not going to happen. The things that they need to get better at are not possible playing next to Donovan Mitchell and Jared Allen. So to me, I mean, yeah, it's, it, it kind of like, I guess if I zoom out another level, it's like they're a small market and they're scared of taking that step back and trusting that they can get better with those internal development happening, they want to stick with what they know can win them 45 to 52 games and they'll ride that out. And that's totally respectable, but I don't think as a fan, what you necessarily want to see. I mean, I, I think the point about Mobley in particular, I think Evan Mobley might be the biggest loser in all of this. Like I, I really tend to think that he is being stifled here. It is not like, and the difference between, I think this and like the Oklahoma city thing with Hartenstein and Holmgren is a point of comparison is I think we're going to see, we might see Chet and Hardenstein play together some next year. I think it's inevitable and it's going to work better because we've, we know Holmgren can and will shoot threes. That does not happen with Mobley yet, and Allen doesn't do it. Unless Evan Mobley shows up shooting threes this summer, I think this we're going to have some of the same problems. And I also don't think we've seen Mobley have to get pushed out of his comfort zone. That to me is just such a major problem in all of this. Like you, and you just gave him a five-year rookie max extension, a deal that I don't agree with this. But when you looked at the the poll that Tim Bontemps, I think, did the ESPN and the worst moves of the summer, someone said that was the worst move of the summer. You're you're not gonna get what you need out of Evan Mobley for him to reach his value and maximize what that's gonna be in this setup. I think that's that to me is probably the biggest flag against it is that you're still continuing to say, hey, Evan Mobley, you don't get to figure out exactly what you can be as a five in this league. So I, I have a point on the Mobley thing, but I just did want to ask. We have not gotten the Jared Allen uh, contract details, right? It's We don't know whether or not it's sort of like the Hartenstein thing where it sort of declines Correct. as an option at the end. We don't have anything on that. So I would be interested to see those details when they come out because that could tell a little bit more of a story of what it is that the Cavaliers front office is thinking with Jared Allen. Um, but to the Evan Mobley point, maybe that's the guy you trade. Mm. Right. We've all been, we've been talking this whole time about trying to trade Jared Allen and why there's only a few teams that actually make sense for Jared Allen. Uh, but there's a lot more teams who make a lot more sense for Evan Mobley. And if you've already decided, well, we're keeping Jared Allen because he's the best guy with Donovan Mitchell and we're basically all in on Donovan Mitchell. We're not all in on Evan Mobley. Then just trade Mobley. And maybe there's a version here of what the the Kings and the Pacers did where the Kings take their really young, promising guy in Tyrese Halliburton who didn't fit with their established guy in De'Aaron Fox and swapped him for a guy that they would have no business otherwise trading for and DeMontis Sabonis, who amplified all the things that their established star does well. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that trade is. It's not Brendan Ingram, but it is, it's something like going out and getting a wing who can kind of play off of Donovan Mitchell or a power forward Marketing. who makes more sense next to Jared Allen. Uh, <laughs> they, they, they could, if they could trade Mobley, for, if honestly... This slight hot take: If they could, if the Jazz said, "We'll give you marketing for Mobley," I would probably do it. 
that might be the best path forward because like I, I do I, tend I, to agree with Brendan where it's, well, what are you doing right here? Um, but I, all, but I, I get it. Like they weren't the best coach team last year. There's no rush to do anything. There really isn't. You just signed everybody. They just, they're locked in. It makes a little bit of sense to me if you were to say, well, let's just at least see what the new coach can do. And then maybe by January, February, we're ready to make some changes or even next summer. You know what this kind of makes me appreciate or, or what other team it kind of makes me appreciate is the Kings. We can all quibble with the idea of, of the Kings getting in their own way and the mess of the Mike Brown contract negotiation extension saga that happened in the spring and the DeRozan deal and if giving up that very far out unprotected pick swap or, or lightly protected pick swap is too big of a risk and all that, but... I appreciate that the Kings didn't rest on their laurels and say, we sucked for so long, we're fine being decent, it is what it is. They kind of did that with the DeMontis bonus extension. We'll just, for the purposes of me continuing to make this argument, I'll ignore that. <laughs> but like, generally speaking, they kept pushing, right? They've kept making moves. They've tried different yes. things. And the Cavs feel like, hey, we've been irrelevant outside of LeBron being on our team for the entire century. So being relevant is pretty nice. Donovan Mitchell makes us that. Jared Allen, these high floor guys, it feels pretty good to be in this position. Let's just ride that out and not rush into anything. And yeah, rushing into things can come up short and the, f the floor can fall out underneath of you sometimes. But I also think pushing, being aggressive, being flexible, being opportunistic, that's always going to get you further. So I wish the Cavs would do that a little bit more and be willing to just take that risk. And yeah, maybe you get 10% worse, but if it makes you 50% better in five years or three years, then ultimately that's worth it. But they, they don't seem to, to see it and do the math that way. Well, the, the Kings also made that risk, and it was definitely risky to trade Halliburton for Sabonis because nobody doubts right now Halliburton is far more the valuable player now. And I think everybody was sort of clowning the Kings for doing that in the first place and, even before Halliburton well, and what he was. On top but of that, wouldn't you take Halliburton over Fox as well? Like that's the other part, like kind of I the would. unspoken part of this. Like I think I'd, I would rather less, Halliburton than Fox. That was less clear. But yeah, now yeah. obviously. But I don't know, even De'Aaron Fox, because they make that trade and pair him with Sabonis, De'Aaron Fox becomes an all-NBA caliber guard. Sabonis yeah, I don't think the gap's that big. his career. I don't think Sacramento. it's huge. Yeah, it's not as big. If you put it's Fox not. on a and team it, that's built like the Pacers, I think it, it might feel pretty similar. Yeah. 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 So um, by trading the thing that is better but doesn't fit, you improve the stuff that was already there and the thing that you traded for. That's really hard to figure out. Like, it's hard to get that chemistry exactly right and it not blow up in your face. But the Kings did it, right? Like, they hit that sweet spot, and that would be – sort of the thing that the Cavaliers had to do. I even go back to last season when we did our like end of the Cavaliers like season eulogy thing. I said, this is a team with an abundance of resources that has an opportunity and a rare one to pivot and not really take a step back if they make the right moves. They have to identify the right players and make the right moves and make the right trades. They probably, and this is just my guess, concluded the right move, the right deal, the right trade just because everybody was, was plugging in Jared Allen for Brandon Ingram in the trade machine did not make sense for us. It wasn't out there. So let's just wait it out and wait for the right stuff to come along. Um, I do think it's a fair point that Brendan made earlier. They, you don't necessarily have to extend Jared Allen. Maybe that was sort of, uh, well, everybody threw him under the bus in that athletic article at the end of the year. So maybe, maybe I can make <laughs> do, do good, like a Jordan Poole extension. Sorry. Yeah. One of our yeah. guys punched you in the face. Here's yeah. a bunch of money. Yeah. Well, I mean, about it. Marcus, Marcus Morris did like go on a show and basically insinuate that Jared Allen was soft. Then JB Bickerstaff, yeah. all when he got fired, basically said that he kind of insinuated that he thought Jared could have played through the ribs. But it's why it is why I want to see the, the details on this contract, because there's a world where depending on what it looks like, he almost, he almost becomes more tradable. Well, I think Despite he becomes more tradable so we'll see. with it no matter what, uh, just because if the if they understood that it wasn't going to happen this summer and you're looking at next deadline, then under the deal before he got this extension, he only had two years left. So by that deadline, you're really trading him on the last year of his contract if you're already, you know, right. all the way through that this upcoming season. So now whatever team might acquire him you're just looking at it as hey i got we got him for four four and a half years and i'm sure that that so you're goes not a dealing long with way the marketing situation you're not dealing with the marketing situation now where teams are like well we either get him and we have to deal with the contract extension ourselves, or we got him on the contract extension and now we're dealing with this tight window 
of whether or not we're going to be able to trade for him. So you just sort of swallow that pill now so that you can not have to deal with it later. I don't have a great case for Luke Kennard, but I... Uh... Let's make it. Let's make it. Try to make it. No, I just want to use it. To, so I'm interested to hear where you're going with it. Basically want to use it as an excuse to just hype up the Memphis Grizzlies. I don't think bringing back Luke Kennard is some kind of massive uh, element in that, but obviously he was supposed to make like 14, 15 million. They, they declined the team option, end up bringing him back on a smaller number. They're dealing with tax stuff. They got rid of Zaire Williams in order to make this happen. But to me, it's just a reminder that Memphis continues to be all in and that they are going to be back. And Obviously, when they acquired Luke Kennard, we all thought it was smart because they've needed shooting for a while. But even if he's the 8th, ninth, 10th man at this point with the growth that Bain has had and Vince Williams coming along and everything else, this is just a deep, good, well-rounded team that is getting John Morant back. Mike Miller, his agent, his new agent, came out today and was kind of echoing this same thing, obviously what an agent should do. But um, I tend Mike to Miller agree that people... Is funny thing. It is. Paolo's agent as well. I just tend to agree with Mike Miller that people have sort of forgotten about this team and, and Ja. And I guess it's just, yeah, an, another excuse to say, hey, don't forget the Memphis Grizzlies. I think they could be a top six seed and push for the second or third round in the Western Conference playoffs, and I would not be shocked at all. Can I make the case for Luke Kennard then? Yeah. And not just use it Great. as a vehicle to Let me to know how he's going to play defense this year, Memphis and I'll be Grizzlies all in. Hype. <laughs> doesn't matter. He's on a one-year, $11 million contract. A real nice, chunky deal for a team that didn't make a lot of offseason moves uh, this summer. You could take that expiring $11 million deal and trade that for something real. Like You can get a real exactly player for my that thought. in February when there's a t other teams that are tanking in the Cooper Flag Cup or whatever we're calling it. Um, you could pair that good, with uh, Brandon Clark's. Twelve and a half million dollar deal, perhaps, if he comes back from this injury looking okay and as a player that somebody wants. Even a John Conchar, who's a mm -hmm. really consumable six million dollar contract. Like they have now that one kind of base level salary that you could stack other things onto and make a pretty substantial move with that. I mean, heck, you can even put it onto Marcus Smart's contract, and now you've got a plus thirty million dollar contract that or, or package that you could send out and in different places. And the Grizzlies are flush with draft picks as well, as a reminder. So this is a team that didn't make a lot of noise in the summer, which is okay. The whole point of the last 12 months is just getting John Morant back and healthy and fine. So you presumably have accomplished that. We, we'll see what ends up, what John Morant looks like this coming season. But then you've positioned yourself now to make a pretty substantial move if you want to um, before the trade deadline and maybe really go for it. That was not really a case exactly for Luke Kennard. Right. I just want to say that was a case yeah. for trading Luke Kennard, he, I, if we're being honest. That was, what is, yeah, what, what's I, the new, I, uh, well, I don't have any new terminology, human trade chip. Yeah. Have any of us said, I mean, I don't think any of us. I'll take $11 million dollars to be a human trade chip. I have I mean, no problem with it. That, that's true. I mean, a little less other taxes, but um, agent fees, all these things, but more than I made last year. Um, the th th yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> The thing about Kennard that at least as long as he's there that I do like is that it is another shooter. I Him and Ja together defensively is tough. It's a lot of pressure on Jaron Jackson. It's a lot of pressure on the rest of that team to mark a smart to like really shore that up. But if Kennard is anything, he is going to be a really good shooter. He's going to move off ball. He can he can get up quick shots. He's going to at least fit with what they I think that offense needs. And if it doesn't work, to your point, it's an $11 million trade chip. Like he's a useful player, I think, can be a good player on a good team. It's circumstantial a little bit because of of his limitations, but like that's a that's a solid player for eleven million dollars, and he'll at least help them until they want to trade it. I think um, you guys might be overstating what that is going. It's going to have to be stacked with somebody as a player who has real value, whether that is smart or him and Clark. If, if Clark looks, yeah, but I mean, are, are we positive Brandon Clark's going to be that? I mean, I would like to think it, but he keeps pushing back his timeline. He's not with Team Canada right now. They could really use him because he continue this never-ending recovery. Um, so we'll see. But I think a team is going to look at two months of Luke Kennard on an $11 million deal that very well, the future for him could be minimums every year after this, is not going to be very high by itself. So you're either stacking a lot of picks with just him or you're having to, to add in players that are, are really, really good to make 
that worth the other teams uh, while. But big picture, this rotation, Ja, Bain, Smart, Aldama, Jackson, Clark, Kennard, Edie, Edie. Vince Williams, Gigi Jackson, somewhere, uh, maybe a little John Conchar sprinkled in, maybe a little less Gigi Jackson, depending on how he develops as a 20-year-old. That's a hell of a team, and it's kind of doesn't have many holes. So outside of shooting, which I agree is a good reason to bring Kennard back, they're always going to be desperate for that. But I don't know. I just think I, I think you could make a case this team is pretty significantly better than the first iteration of these Grizzlies teams that were 50-plus win groups and you know vying for the second, third round every year. I, I think they're even better than that. Yeah, I think we need to maybe slow down a little bit on that just because I need to see John Morant. I know he looked awesome when he came back uh, from the suspension and then he gets hurt for a week, but he's dealt, he has been, he has dealt with so much over the last year. Plus it's just mentally, physically hard to come back from that. I remain a John Morant optimist and a huge fan of his. So I'm rooting for the best. And I, if you, if you had to make me bet $5, I would bet that he's fine. He's young enough and all these things, but it's just a lot to come back from everything that he's gone through. But if he looks anything close to what he has been for most of his career, then I'm totally with you. I'm totally here on, on the Grizzlies bandwagon there. Can I make a quick point, uh, just since we didn't even talk about the Precious Achua part? Yeah. One year, $6 million for what is going to end up being the Knicks starting center for a few games. Yeah, no, the it's... starting center right now is Mitchell Robinson, which yeah, means more than that a few. Uh, Precious Achua is definitely starting some games they have. Mitchell Robinson, Jericho Sims, and now Achua coming back on a one-year $6 million deal, which is a nice deal for him, or for the Knicks, I should say. Kind of not great for Precious, but um, that's it. Those are my Precious Achua thoughts. They might have just paid $6 million to bring back a player who's going to start quite a few games for him. Yeah, Achua, my only point there. We also might see some Julius Randle at the five. A lot of people have talked about how they have the flexibility to do that in a way that they didn't with the previous construction of the roster when it was quickly and smaller guys. But Achua to me is funny with this next situation because the question with him was always, what is he? Is he a forward? Is he a center? Is he maybe a wing? Like what exactly is this guy's role? kind of the curse of being too versatile. And it's just funny to me that the, the the destination in his career where that would finally lock in and he would excel in a very specific role and, and answer that question is for a coach who has actively refused to ever play this type of player at center ever before. It's just like a very funny pairing of Tibbs and Achua where Achua plays up from what we thought because Tibbs, who wants to play a traditional center, is like begrudgingly like, damn it, I guess that's my only guy. So more of that this yep. upcoming season will just be funny to watch. It's it's a buddy cop movie, right? It's yeah. sort of the the odd couple. Uh, and so I think we're all here for it from for it from an entertainment factor. Until he's like Taj, you can you can you can you come in? Can we can we get I think Taj? Taj is on the Hornets this year. I think you got a guaranteed deal yeah, in Charlotte, can. so Got to trade for him. How much are you giving up? Yeah. yeah. Two two seconds for Taj? Seems like a lot. I don't think there is a limit Not for if, Tibbs. if Tibbs is in charge, yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's that's also yeah, true. Yeah, for, for Tom Thibodeau, there's... They have one more first-round pick that they can move? <laughs> there's, you know, select, like top 20 protections on a first for Taj? Man, that guy still being Do in the league and getting guaranteed you. money is elite bag getting. 39 years what? old on June 24th, and he is making $3.3 million five years after he did much of anything in terms of impact on the court. He's he's like, Udonis Haslam needs to watch the throne here. It's getting there. I mean, honestly, yeah, and it's not just like one team like being corrupt and giving the same guy yeah, deals over and no, over again, he's, you know? he's He's working a new team every single year for the past five, six years. It's, it's wonderful. It must be a great he, interview. Is Taj is Taj the McKinsey of like is he like the McKinsey consultant of NBA players? Is that like what we're learning? He just like makes money. We don't really know why. Is that a movie reference? No, that's like a McKinsey, a big public consulting firm, Wes. And like the joke is that what do consultants actually do? But like tell you how, what tell you ah. like how to improve your flow. You know, is Taj I mean, just those like, in like the background 15th of the locker room? men vet guys kind of are just consultants. Like that is actually a good description yeah. of what hey, Jim, their job is. They're yeah. they're an NBA consultant. Yeah. yeah. 
the Cavs at one point had James Jones, Dante Jones, and Kendrick Perkins all like filling that role, and it was like, did you need three of these that. guys? Did you James need Johnson in Indiana? Maybe. Same thing right now. He just got another yeah. deal to go back. Like that, that's great work if you can get it. Yeah, they're all there tends to be a thing where those guys like will fight another team if you need them to, which is like, which is like an attribute that is probably only good for consultants in the NBA and not like in corporate America. What was the original term? I think Zach Lowe created it, the chemist, right? Wasn't that his his term for that once upon yeah. a time? The guy who's just there to spread the good vibes and, and clap really hard when a good play happens? <laughs> yeah, Tristan Thompson's in that, that yeah. lane now of his career. That's where Kevin Love's career is kind of going right now, yeah, too. Yeah, and, I mean, and there's can, nothing can wrong just, with that. Did you see how gray did you oh. see how gray Kevin Love was in that last photo he posted and that with a buzz cut? I, I mean, I've been with them in locker rooms recently. I've seen the Grays. I just, yeah. it, I just saw that photo and it was as stark as I'd ever seen it. And I was like, yes. Damn. Yep. I was like, yep. wow. It's okay. a gray beard now. Yeah. Uh huh. It's Still a flex. Gray. All right, Wes, you have a, I believe, yeah. So we, so are we? If we're gonna rank these, I would just say Jared Allen, Kennard, Achua. That would be my three. That's how I'd rank this. Yeah, I think we're in agreement. It's fine. Okay, Wes, you got a question for us. Personal question corner time. Um, so I just spent three days in Nashville, Tennessee, in case you didn't know. And uh, it's in had a great time. Oh. Yeah. Had a great time. This was a week after, two weeks after whenever Vegas Summer League was. Uh, spent two days in Las Vegas. After two days in Las Vegas, I was pretty much done with Las Vegas. After three days in Nashville, I was pretty much done with Nashville. But if you really made me have to do another day, I probably could have done it. My question to you is I'm giving you three days with Monopoly money. You get to go anywhere uh, in America. I'm not okay. like, so you don't get to pick like a visa or something. Like, you got to <laughs> stay in the States. I wouldn't have picked Where a visa. I'll tell you that much. Um, hmm. So I, th I think there's a couple ways you could answer this. I think New York is like a simple answer. You could do a lot of great with the limited money in New York, access to a lot of great restaurants. Well, we don't have limited money, right? That we have unlimited money. Isn't that, no, that's, that's what I'm saying. Question, I, right? said, I said, okay, I'm, okay. I, I'm, I'm at unlimited. I'm at unlimited. Vegas is also just a great option because if I don't have repercussions in Las Vegas, that just sounds like an insane thing. Like you could do a lot you of. You could things. just sit at the table the whole time <laughs> and just turn your unlimited money into more uh, unlimited money or yeah, less unlimited or, money. or less limited money. It's like un unlimited drinks at the table, <laughs> like unlimited like sports betting, like a lot of things you could get up to in Vegas with limited money that also could. F but it takes it, the fun out of it, doesn't it? Like, don't you well, want to feel something? My stress level. There? What, what, what's my stress level? No, I don't want to feel like I'm having like, heart palpitations because I'm like riding like the over under on like a on like a Sunday NFL That's game. The whole you fun know? of it. No, I don't. I don't like feeling like I'm gonna die. Um. I think New York. You know, I think New York's my answer. I, I, and I, I think I should have taken New York off the table. I feel like okay, if you take easy. New York off the table, um, my answer is not New York. I'll let you think of a of a second. Yeah, so I'm, I, I, yeah, I fully acknowledge New York's not for everybody. So go ahead. No, I love New, New York. I, I, I mean, I. It's not because I don't like it. It's just my mind went. If I have a budget, I kind of am gonna blow it on where i'm staying chips so in new york it's like yeah i could get some like penthouse like apartment but like eh, that's not super different it's just a little bigger is that really like my dream of all dreams to just stay in like a slightly bigger hotel in new york city not really so my mind went to like can i have like a really nice cabin either in new england in like the summer oh. or fall or like you know, the Northwest somewhere, you know, whether that's like Washington, Oregon, or even like Yellowstone, Montana, whatever, somewhere. And that would obviously not, let's not do summer there, but you know, maybe like a, like a nice March stay and then just like go crazy and spend money on whatever I want to do while I'm at the house, you know, unlimited drinks, food, bring people over. We're, we're renting what, like ATV, like I don't know, whatever. After that, let's let's buy some horses and see what happens. Like I just, but I want to be secluded. If I have all the money in the world, I'm trying to get away from everybody and like invite just my friends and have like a, a more unique experience. So I could cheat and say Hawaii and do the same thing, but I feel like that's against the spirit of the rule. You said U.S. I think you were trying to yep. exclude the uh, tropical, but I'm I'm looking for a cabin. I'm looking to it's like a two million dollar cabin. I'm just buying it. Um, 
the the sales job on just getting like a ranch in Wyoming or Montana is strong. You know, like that's I can easily see myself getting the space, kind of just doing my thing. Probably find a place with like a basketball court or a, a like a hole, like a a three, a par three or something like that, just to like mess around with, and spending all my time eating bison and drinking bourbon. And Man, bison's really good. Got to tell right? you, bison's very good. Bison's very, uh, very I, good. I've had an elk burger before. I have. Uh, I have. You ground, get all those options. Out I have. There, so I have ground elk in my fridge right now that I'm going to make elk tacos with this evening. Nice. I'm actually. That's the only thing you've ever said that I've been jealous of. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've won. <laughs> <laughs> so hmm. something like that. But when it comes down to it, just send me to New York for a weekend. I could spend every day there. I could find stuff to do. You said like all you're going to get is a, two, a five million dollar penthouse. Hell yeah, sign me up. I'll take the five million dollar penthouse. Bring my friends. We could. There's literally something to do in New York all the time. There'll be shows. There'll be a bunch of entertainment. I can go to a comedy show every night. VIP tickets at concerts, whatever it is. I just feel like you could just pick a weekend and it would be awesome. New York but, or LA are the answers for like if you want like a bunch of stuff to do. Those are unequivocally yeah. the city. You have to pick one of those two cities. I like being entertained because like the whole idea of getting a place and then just like riding ATVs sounds awful. For one me. weekend, I don't, I don't want to live there forever. West, West, no, for West, sure, West can't know. do bourbon and ATVs. Don't mix is what I would is what I think we're getting at. <laughs> you true. know what? And the ironic part about that is the only way you're getting me on an ATV is with yeah. quite a bit of bourbon involved. So which is a bad idea. Let's maybe. I'm avoid not sure that. if bourbon <laughs> and the New York subway system necessarily mix all that I think well. But I, I guess at that point money. Money. you're taking an Uber. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, limited money. No, not even. You're getting like a black. Like you're getting like give me the lux. Yeah, you're getting you're getting driven around in that city at that point. You're getting a limousine or something. Yeah. My yep. non, if I was gonna go non Best restaurants York, in the world, yeah, I think my non New York answer actually might be San Francisco. Mm-hmm. I'm not really an LA guy. The vibe of LA has never quite really appealed to me. San Francisco, like, has the restaurant culture. It's Northern California. I could take a little day trip, like, out to like a national park and stuff. Like, I, I, I think I'm gonna nap is nearby. I still know the, uh, I still have the address and know the landlord for a 401 square foot apartment that will cost you all of your money if you're interested in San Francisco. So. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm, that sounds awful. Same it's thing okay. With, it was in the tenderloin. Okay. Which is the bad part. Oh, okay. So you didn't live in a nice part of San Francisco, to what you're telling us? Yeah, but I had all 401 square feet just to myself. <laughs> and no money. And no money left over after that. No. <laughs> and my Heaven. car only got broken into twice in oh. the first week. Yeah. I think you're making a really good case for why you don't live there anymore. <laughs> That'll yeah, be it. yeah. Okay. Is there is Westwood? My, I mean, you live there, but like, if you, would you make a case for Miami to Brendan and I? Would you say like Miami is uh, a good city for this yeah, question? If you if you want to be endlessly entertained, uh, be sweating every time you walk outside, which <laughs> I know. some people like. I love it. I the more shirts I can go through in an afternoon, the better. Um, and just see ocean basically all the time. Beautiful weather. Beautiful people, music and rhythm everywhere, great food. You can get up to quite a bit in Miami. The only thing is you've got to really be into maybe going out at night to like clubs and stuff. That's where most people spend their money. Yeah, I'm out. And you would get all the VIP stuff and things like that. But I live here and I haven't been to a club in five years. It's like in uh, three weeks. In three (laughs) weeks. Since last night. (laughs) But uh, and I have I have a great time here. But yeah, okay. I that's, I, the, that's the case. Also now, but Brendan, now that I'm thinking about this, I think you know. Well, Wes, you're a movie buff now. I think LA would also be a good answer because I could just bribe my way into movie premieres. I am a movie buff now. I have seen one movie. So yeah, you graduated, and I listened to a podcast about a movie that I've already seen the other day. So I'm nice. pretty much going to the con, wow. the festival next year. So. We're, we're like a week away from West being like, guys, I'm leaving the basketball media. I'm just going to be a full time letterbox content creator. That's going to be West yeah. in like a week, just crushing mm-hmm. tape. It's coming, crushing literally tape. Yeah, he's just like I'm a VHS guy. That's all I'm I do. Big big VHS vintage. You can get them cheap now. Yeah, it's pretty good. Got to rewind them. <laughs> Yeah, right. kids these days don't understand. They don't. They don't know the the toughness. All right, we're gonna end there though. This has been the Just Basketball Show for August first. Back next week, more Olympics, maybe some trades. We're getting close to that Lowry Market and extension window. 
Is something going to happen there? Maybe we'll find out this weekend, but have a great one, everyone. We'll talk to you next week.